Lexus is clearly the king of the hybrid. They sell more hybrids than anybody else. More models are available with hybrid systems in the Lexus lineup really as well. But when it comes to vehicles with a plug outside of Tesla, BMW, interestingly enough, reigns supreme. They sell more plug-in hybrids than any other luxury competitor out there. The BMW 530e is the best-selling luxury plug-in hybrid, period. And with 12,000 vehicles a year with a plug going out of BMW showrooms, they beat Volvo quite handily, even though Volvo offers a plug-in hybrid system in pretty much every vehicle in their lineup. And BMW, in fact, even beats the entire Hyundai-Kia conglomerate combined in the United States by about two to one in terms of plug-in hybrid sales. And that's why when it came time to review the BMW X3, I clearly had to ask for the plug-in hybrid model. When it comes to luxury plug-in sales, I expect this is going to beat the 530e in the United States for the title of best-selling luxury plug-in hybrid because the X3 is their best-selling model. Nearly one quarter of all BMWs sold in the US are BMW X3s, and the plug-in hybrid has a lot going for it. I think it's easy to see why the X3 has become the best-selling BMW in the US. There's nothing controversial with its design. It's definitely a handsome vehicle, and it combines the overall size factor and price factor of the BMW 3 Series with an awful lot more practicality and that big cargo area in the back without, of course, looking like a station wagon. And really, when you think about it, most modern crossovers are just the modern interpretation of the station wagon. We have a bigger box, but we have all that wagon-like practicality. Up front, we get a large BMW grill that is definitely a little bit less hungry than in some of BMW's larger SUVs. We get standard LED headlamps up front and standard LED fog lamps down below, which is definitely a nice touch. Ground clearance is pretty decent for the luxury segment as well, so if you want to go a little bit further off the beaten path and you want to do it in style, then an X3 might be a good option for you. That promise of the ability to go a little bit further off the beaten path in your X3 than your 3 Series is, of course, also part of the reason that the X3 is outselling the 3 Series in America. As with the rest of the European competition, BMW goes about active safety a little bit differently than the Asian luxury players. So we don't find things like radar adaptive cruise control standard on the X3, but we do find autonomous braking and pedestrian detection standard on every model, and of course the slew of BMW's latest safety features available. I'm really surprised that really none of the European luxury players are including all of the same kind of standard feature content when it comes to active safety that we see in the Lexus lineup, for instance. Or, of course, a Toyota Corolla. The Corolla comes standard with radar adaptive cruise control. The BMW X3 and most of the European competition just don't. For this generation, the BMW engineers stuck pretty close to the formula that has made the X3 such a success. We definitely have an attractive design overall with this long hood proportion because, of course, it is designed for inline six engines under the hood, just like the BMW 3 Series. And then we have a relatively practical and upright box behind it. There is, of course, a BMW X4 if you want something that's a little bit sexier styled, and that has allowed the 3 Series to retain this relatively square and practical back end. I find it interesting that when we take a look at alternatives like a Cadillac XT4 or perhaps a Lincoln Corsair, that the overall design does tend to be a little bit compromised right back here in the rear. And for the most part, the European luxury players have gone for very square styling that retains a lot of the crossover practicality that you'd expect. As with the front, there's nothing controversial going on back here. We have full LED tail lamp modules. They're definitely nice and large. They wrap from the body on over there to the lift gate lid. And then we have twin exhaust tips down here at the bottom, even in the plug-in hybrid model. BMW keeps their hybrids pretty discreet. There are no blue logos or anything like that going on around the vehicle. Really, the only indication that this is an electrified model is that little E right there after the xDrive 30 logo. One of the reasons that BMW sells more plug-in hybrids in the US than any other luxury entry, for instance, Volvo, is that BMW is treating their hybrid systems very differently than Volvo does in their lineup. Volvo treats their plug-in hybrids as the range topping engine option, producing 400 or more horsepower in most of their models, whereas BMW targets this at entry-level shoppers. In fact, the plug-in hybrid version of the X3 after the tax credit is the least expensive way to get an all-wheel drive X3. This comes in $1,200 less than an X330i with all-wheel drive at 42714 after the federal tax credit. And depending on the state you live in, there may be additional state and local incentives that could make this even less expensive or allow you access to the carpool lane without anybody else in the car. The hybrid system is based around the same engine that we find in the base X3. In the base X3, it produces 248 horsepower and 258 pound-feet of torque. 
Combined with all-wheel drive, it'll get you 26 miles per gallon combined on the EPA cycle and get you zero to 60 in six seconds flat. In the hybrid model, they detune the engine a little bit, so it produces 180 horsepower instead of 248, but when combined with the 107 horsepower electric motor, we get 288 horsepower total. How do we end up with 288 when you combine 107 plus 180? I have no idea that is German math, but we're told that the total is 288. Anyway, you slice it, this will go zero to 60 slightly faster than the non-hybrid model as well, 5.9 seconds rather than six seconds even. And of course, we have an 18 mile electric range. As you'd expect out of a hybrid system, fuel economy definitely changes versus the base model, but unexpectedly, it actually goes down. We get 24 miles per gallon combined once the battery is exhausted, likely because of the added weight of the hybrid system versus 26 in the non-hybrid model. But we do get that EV range. This is where things get a little bit different than I think the X3 Hybrid's most direct competitor, which is the Volvo XC60 T8. In the Volvo lineup, the best fuel economy is in the hybrid, 27 miles per gallon, one mile per gallon combined better than the Nod hybrid version of this. And the non-hybrid version is about the same as this at 23 miles per gallon combined. So they sort of flip flop in the lineup. But the Volvo hybrid system not only gives you better fuel economy, it also gives you significantly better performance, almost a full second faster than this hybrid system right here because it produces 400 horsepower and nearly 500 pound feet of torque. But the way that system operates is quite different than the BMW system. The key difference between the Volvo system and the BMW system is that BMW is still using a true mechanical all wheel drive system. And that's one of the reasons that you might wanna get this over that Volvo. Even though Volvo has done an excellent job on their e all wheel drive system, it's still not gonna feel like this out on the road in terms of overall driving dynamics. And it's not gonna feel quite the same if the going gets a little bit stickier. The only real difference in terms of overall driving dynamics between this all-wheel drive system and the all-wheel drive system on the non-hybrid model is the amount of curb weight we find in this vehicle and of course the weight distribution because BMW has located the batteries in the rear and that gives this interestingly enough a rear weight bias versus a pretty balanced weight bias in the non-hybrid models and I do love a vehicle with a slightly heavier rear end that really helps improve the overall steering feel. The other thing to keep in mind is that Volvo has really positioned the XC60 T8 as kind of sort of a competitor to the 382 horsepower BMW X3 M40i because overall zero to 60 performance is closer to that M40i than this particular model. Volvo's hybrid system is kind of unique because they place the battery in the center tunnel between the passenger and driver's seats in the vehicle, and that's why it can't have a mechanical all-wheel drive system, because the area that would normally be occupied by that drive shaft is instead occupied by hybrid components. BMW does things a little bit differently, and they place the battery right back here in the cargo area. That means that, unlike the XC60, cargo capacity does drop if you choose the hybrid model. But it doesn't drop as much as you might think, just from 28.7 cubic feet down to 27.2. So this is still in the middle of the pack when it comes to overall cargo capacity. This is still a pretty accommodating cargo area. You can see this is the only difference right here in terms of the cargo room. This about two inch loss in terms of the overall height. That's all down to the 12 kilowatt hour battery that we find back here that gives us that 18 to 20 mile range. Lifting up the load floor, we do find a tiny bit of additional storage space. This is where you can store, for instance, the level one charger right there that apparently has never been used in this particular model. We've been charging it with the level two connector that we own. There's also enough room under here just barely to store the roller cargo cover, but oddly enough, not while you have this EVSE in place. Front seat comfort is excellent. I give these seats nine out of 10 points. They're not quite as adjustable as some of the competitive seats. We don't find things like active seat massage available in the X3. We do, however, have a manual extending thigh cushion, inflatable side bolsters, four-way adjustable lumbar support, and of course, a tilt telescopic steering column. This one is manual. Unlike the Acura and Lexus competition, the front passenger seat also has the same range of motion as the driver's seat, including the four-way lumbar support and the inflatable bolsters. If you or your passengers are on the taller side of things, then you should know that we do have more headroom in here than we find in most of the competition. Even though the X3 has a pretty upright seating position up front, I still have about four inches of headroom left. Hopping into the second row, we find more headroom than we find in most of the competition, even though we do have this large panoramic moonroof right here. But on the other hand, we do find a little bit less legroom than in the front wheel drive competition like the XC60 or the Acura RDX. You'll really notice that if the front seat is adjusted for me at six feet tall and I sit right behind it, I have about three to four inches of legroom left. That's gonna make this a little bit tighter for rear facing child seats or some larger folks to sit in the back. But the counterpoint to that, of course, is the extra headroom that we find back here. 
Speaking of roominess in the back seat, if you are trying to compare this to something like a Tesla Model Y, we recently had the opportunity to drive one of those. There is a full review on the channel as well. You'll notice that the rear seat area in the X3 is a little bit wider than the Model Y, about two inches wider overall. So if you are planning on trying to put child seats and adults in the back of your small luxury crossover, they may fit better in the X3 than in the Tesla because of the overall width. However, we do get a little bit less legroom. The rear seats can be folded via controls back here in the cargo area or from the second row itself. And the rear seats fold in a 40-20-40 fashion, which really makes cargo carrying very practical. Rather unexpectedly, the fuel filler line to the gas tank occupies kind of an odd bump right there on the right side of the cargo area. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that the model that we're testing today has an MSRP of about $65,000. So it definitely has a lot of options that you won't find on the base model X3. We have this large panoramic moonroof here that goes to just about over the rear passenger's heads. We have fixed height shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger along with four-way adjustable headrests. And this vehicle does have optional leather upholstery. The bolstering on the seat back cushion is not terribly aggressive. It's also a little bit less aggressive on the seat bottom cushion, so larger folks won't have any problem with these seats. I definitely didn't find them hitting me in any strange places. If we move on over to the front doors, we find a larger percentage of soft touch materials than we found in the previous generation of X3. And of course, everything is definitely very nicely done there from the leather stitching right there in the middle of the door and on the armrest to this very attractive open pour wood trim. I really like what BMW has done with their wood trim lately. You can also see the adjustable ambient lighting strip running right there at the top of that wood trim area. We have the optional Harman Kardon audio system in this particular model. So we have some different speaker grills right there on the door. Moving over to the dashboard, we have stitching right up there on the top to help dress things up a little bit. Again, more of that open pour wood trim. We do find harder plastics down lower on the dashboard, just as you'd expect, but they again have been reduced versus the previous model. This now has a different texture, making it feel more premium than the average hard plastic you'd find in a mainstream vehicle. If I open up the glove compartment, we find a relatively small bin style compartment. I was not able to fit a tablet computer inside. Moving around to the center of the dashboard, we find BMW's latest iDrive system. This is controllable via the iDrive controller in the center of the dashboard or via the touchscreen, which is a nice touch. This is one of the few systems available currently that uses wireless Apple CarPlay, but oddly enough, we don't have a wireless charging mat in this interior. A nice touch is that CarPlay does occupy that entire screen, as you can see, not a smaller portion of the screen like we see in the latest Mercedes infotainment systems. Again, more of that open pour wood trim there, engine start stop button, some physical controls for the infotainment system. We also have a button for our active safety system enable disable, and then the controls for the standard three zone automatic climate control right down here little BMW X3 logo. We have a roller cover for this storage area. This is where we find a USB power socket. But again, oddly enough, no wireless charging mat there. We have two large cup holders, easily able to accommodate large American style takeout drinks. And then a lot of buttons over here in the center console. That's the controller for the iDrive system. This is the shifter right here. We have a manual mode over to the left. We have a button for the stability and traction control system. These relate to the drive modes. We have Sport, Comfort, Eco Pro, and then of course, Adaptive. Some drive mode settings are also adjustable via the infotainment system. We then have an E-Drive button. This controls the way the hybrid system operates, whether we want it to be an auto E-Drive, max E-Drive, which uses mainly electric energy, or whether we want this in the battery charge mode. We then have buttons for the parking sensors, the 360 degree camera system, hill descent control, the electric parking brake, and auto brake hold. Between the front seats, we have a padded center armrest that opens to reveal a definitely larger storage compartment than we find in Volvo's plug-in hybrid. That's because there's no battery living right here under the center console. There's also a USB-C charge point there. The instrument cluster is a full LCD unit. You can see that the theme does change if I go from, for instance, the Eco Pro mode over here to the Sport mode, but it's not as configurable as the displays that we find in modern Mercedes models. We can hit a button on the turn signal stock to rotate through a few different options over here on the right side of the screen, but the left side of the screen is pretty much just used for the speedometer. Moving out from there, we find one of BMW's new round steering wheel designs. We have pretty aggressive sport grips up top, paddle shifters on the back. We have down over here on the left and up over there on the right. A nice leather stitched airbag cover right here. This is a really premium touch that we don't find in too many luxury players. And I am surprised by that, 
even in some very expensive Volvo interiors, for instance, we still get a hard plastic airbag cover. Over here on this side, we find some infotainment buttons, volume up, down, a roller knob for the infotainment system. This allows us to choose tracks from a list rather than simply track forward and backward, which we can do with these two buttons. You'll find those choices in the heads-up display or in the infotainment screen if you don't get the heads-up display. Voice command button. This is a mode button for the system, so we can change the music input. Dedicated phone button right over there. And then we get the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control over here on the left. First thing you'll notice out on the road is that BMW's hybrid system has become significantly more refined over time. The first generation BMW plug-in hybrid system had some pretty aggressive transitions, shall we say, from hybrid mode to non-hybrid mode to EV mode and back. And that is not the case with this hybrid system. So even if I were to put this in the max e-drive mode, which is gonna change us over to electric operation here. So now we're in full electric operation. The instrument cluster has now adjusted to say that up to about 60% of vehicle power requested can be taken from that battery in the rear. That means that we can climb this mountain road relatively gently in full EV mode. But if more power is requested, say after we exit this corner and I dig deeper into the throttle, then it is going to turn on the gasoline engine eventually. In max E drive mode, it's gonna be less aggressive at turning on that engine in some of the other drive modes, but it will happen. And of course, if you floor it, that's where we're gonna get the most power out of the system. But even in situations where we've commanded the maximum oomph from the EV system, and then we're commanding even more and it has to engage the gasoline engine, those transitions are all significantly smoother than they were before. And you'll really notice that if we move over to, for instance, the auto e-drive mode, which is more like a conventional hybrid tune with some extra power coming from the battery. So it's gonna be a lot more aggressive at starting the engine, a lot less aggressive at using the battery for everything. In this drive mode, we get transitions that feel more like kick down shifts in a transmission than mode shifts in most hybrid systems out there. Whether you're out on your favorite winding mountain road or if for some reason you wanted to track your plug-in hybrid crossover, this has the strong rear wheel drive dynamics that we've come to expect from BMW. And because of the placement of the battery pack, I actually find the steering to be a little bit more my taste than the non-hybrid versions of the X3 because more of the weight is on the back axle. It does help the front end feel a little bit more nimble. Things are very different in a Lexus hybrid or in the Volvo hybrid. The Volvo hybrid is unquestionably powerful. It is significantly faster than this system. Volvo says that that model will go zero to 60 in five seconds flat. They're lying. They've pulled a page out of BMW's playbook and that model will go zero to 60 in about 4.8 to 4.9 seconds. Rather uncharacteristically for BMW, this model exactly matches what they say it will do. So 5.9 seconds, zero to 60. BMW tends to underrate a lot of their models. So this is essentially the same as the xDrive 30i in our testing, which was just a teeny bit faster than their advertised claim. In our 60 to zero braking test, we got 114 feet from 60 miles an hour back to zero in this model. That's primarily because this one has an M Sport package on it and we have some pretty wide tires, 275 with tires in the back, definitely wide tires all the way around. And that really has an impact on the braking score and on the handling score. Also, rather unfortunately, on the overall efficiency score of this particular model. So even though this is theoretically the more efficiency focused version of the BMW X3, keep in mind that hybrid fuel economy when operating outside of the plug-in mode is not gonna be as high as the non-hybrid model. And of course, if you get these sporty packages on your X3, then fuel economy is gonna take an even further tumble. The counterpoint to that, of course, is the improved handling ability because when it comes to handling, I am absolutely gonna give this model an A+. Handling is absolutely excellent. Handling dynamics are gonna be the significant difference between this and most of the luxury hybrids that we see out there, whether we're talking about a Lexus NX or RX hybrid or the Volvo XC60 T8 plug-in hybrid. The only vehicle that could compete with this in terms of overall driving dynamics is going to be the upcoming Mercedes-Benz GLC plug-in hybrid because it uses a hybrid system that is thematically very similar to what we find in this model. Within the BMW envelope, that means that this really is a no compromises plug-in hybrid. We lose a little bit of cargo space in the back, but we actually get no loss in zero to 60 or 60 to zero stopping distances that I've seen, even though this does seem to weigh a little bit more than that other X3. I think the main reason for that is the weight balance because the weight happens in the rear. This stopped almost identically with a dealer provided X330i. Out on a rougher road like we're on here, as you'd expect out of a theoretically sporty option in this segment, the X3 is definitely firmer than something like the Mercedes-Benz GLC in certain trims, the Q5, or of course the Volvo XC60. 
Volvo's XC60 T8, which could be seen as a direct competitor to this plug-in hybrid model, kind of marches to a different drummer. We have an optional adaptive air suspension in that model, one of the very few air suspensions in this smaller luxury crossover category, and that definitely gives it a little bit softer of a ride. But the ride is also tuned differently to the German competition. It's not quite as engaging. We get a little bit more body roll, a little bit more tip and dive. That just seems to be the way that Volvo prefers to tune their vehicles. If you're looking for something that feels a little bit sharper, a little bit more dynamic out on the road, again, the X3 plug-in hybrid is gonna be the option for you. And as we've seen in a wide variety of BMW's latest products, the suspension tuning honestly ends up being Goldilocks just right for me. We don't really have rock hard suspension tuning in here like we do see in the performance variants of some of the competition. For instance, versions of the GLC, like the GLC 63, they can get pretty darn harsh in their stiffest suspension modes. We don't see that in most trims of the X3. This is pretty livable overall. In our cabin noise testing, we got 70.5 decibels in here, putting this on the slightly quieter end of average for a compact luxury crossover. Now remember, we do have pretty wide tires on this model, and that does result in some extra cabin noise, especially coming from the rear, where we have those 275 with tires. So out on rougher pavement, this is not quite as serene as the base versions of the X3 with the base tire size. And now we must talk about fuel economy. In our range test, we got about 16 miles of full electric range out of this, treating it relatively gently. Now that did include some highway driving that's obviously below the EPA score. And when using this as a regular hybrid, we were averaging about 23.2 miles per gallon, not charging it at all. That is definitely a little bit below the EPA score of the regular non-hybrid X3. But keep in mind that BMW sent us a model with some crazy wide tires. I suspect that if we had the regular stock tires in this model, we probably would be getting about the EPA range score and about the EPA fuel economy average. Now that is going to be lower than something like Volvo's XC60 T8. Keep that in mind. So if you are looking for a plug-in hybrid and you want the best fuel economy, the Volvo system really is the unicorn in this segment because not only does it beat this in terms of overall fuel economy and performance, it honestly beats the Lexus hybrids in terms of fuel economy as well, which is surprising since the Lexus hybrid systems definitely don't have the thrust that we see in that Volvo plug-in hybrid. But again, the big difference is driving dynamics. Because of the very design of Volvo's hybrid system, it has this unusual tendency where you can get oversteer and torque steer, oddly, at the same time. Most of the power happens on the front axle, but there is a lot of power happening all the way around, and it can get the rear end to step out just a tiny bit out on particular road surfaces, while also simultaneously giving you torque steer. We don't find any of that going on here in the BMW X3. This feels just like any other BMW out there, and that's probably the big reason that you might want to get the X3 with the plug-in hybrid system. This feels just like any other X3, but you can drive electric only for 18 to perhaps 20 miles if you treat it very gently. Now, even though the fuel economy is lower in this when driving it just as a hybrid than the non-hybrid model, most folks out there will be getting better fuel economy overall than this because they're gonna be able to shift some of that consumption over to electricity. And that's the big reason you'd want this. Even if you cannot charge at the office and you're only charging at home, this should drop the average American's fuel consumption by about half because most folks don't have a commute over about 15 or 20 miles. On the other hand, of course, if you want to go full EV, there is no iX3 available in the US. So that's where you'd wanna take a look at the Jaguar or of course the Tesla. Honestly, the plug-in hybrid version of the X3 is the no-brainer base model. If you're not planning on getting the inline six or the M version of the X3, I would just stop right here at the plug-in hybrid. The MSRP is $48,550 with all-wheel drive. That is a standard feature, but you get a $5,836 tax credit. And honestly, most people shopping in this segment are going to qualify for that full federal tax credit. That brings the price down to $42,714 right between the rear-wheel drive version of the base X3 and the all-wheel drive X30i. So unless for some reason you really don't want all-wheel drive, the plug-in hybrid is gonna be less expensive effectively. And there's some additional state and local tax incentives depending on where you live and the ability to drive solo in the carpool lane in states like California. That's a really big selling proposition for a lot of folks out there. We also get a little bit more power, but not really improved zero to 60 performance. It goes from again, 248 horsepower up to 288 horsepower. But there is a caveat here, unless you really plan on charging the vehicle at least once a day on your daily commute, 
or charging it on both sides of your daily commute, then you may want to look back at the non-plug-in hybrid model because we do get that slightly lower fuel efficiency, 24 miles per gallon. 18 miles of range means that most folks out there, even if you have a longer commute, even if it's 50 or 60 miles a day, something along those lines, and you're only able to charge it once, you will still effectively end up saving gasoline in the plug-in hybrid version. But the real benefit is gonna be for folks that can charge in both directions, or daily commute directions are less than about 20 miles or so. Keep in mind that the range does drop in the plug-in hybrid version of the X3, only 340 miles when gasoline and electricity have been combined because of the size of the gas tank. That's down to the fact that this is a plug-in hybrid vehicle with the mechanical all-wheel drive system. So the drive shaft and the rear wheel drive components have to all be in there as well. The one caveat to the payback would be if you live in hilly terrain like I do. In my daily driving cycle, I ended up getting slightly better fuel economy in this than in the non-hybrid version of the X3, primarily because it could recharge the battery on the way down the hill and make use of that power somewhere else. Aside from that, it really is a no compromises plug-in hybrid. We do lose a little bit of cargo room, but not a lot. We gain a little bit of weight, but BMW has masked that pretty well. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the competition. First, we have the new Mercedes-Benz GLC 350e. Now, when you're looking at the GLC 350e out there online, be sure that you're looking at the 2020 model because we get a new GLC 350e. Wow, that's a mouthful. Uh, it gets more power and a little bit more range than the previous 2019 model. It'll start at $51,900, but there are some details that we don't know just yet. We do know, however, it's going to give you 315 horsepower, a whopping 516 pound-feet of torque, and 70 mpge supposedly when operating in EV mode, but we don't know what the fuel economy is going to be like when it's operating in hybrid mode, and we don't know what the range figures will be just yet either. It does have a battery that's a little bit bigger, 13.5 kilowatt hours. I assume it's going to give us about 20 to 22 miles of EV range based on the battery capacity and their claimed mpge rating. Zero to 60 performance appears to be better than the BMW model, but keep in mind, it's more expensive as well. 51,009 versus 48,550. They're saying zero to 60 in 5.6 seconds, so about four tenths of a second faster or so. We don't know how much cargo room there will be in the GLC 350e, but you can bet it's gonna be less than the X3 because the regular version of the GLC has a smaller cargo area and it is going to lose room because of that battery pack and its overall position. So I expect it to be somewhere under 20 cubic feet, notably more in the BMW X3, basically. Next up, we have the Audi Q5 plug-in hybrid. It's gonna be available for $52,900 a little bit later in calendar year 2020. We're told to expect 65 MPGE, so a little bit more efficient in EV mode, 27 MPG, so more efficient in hybrid mode as well. This may actually be the most efficient plug-in hybrid in this segment when operating as a hybrid but 20 miles of EV range, so not a lot more than we find in the BMW, and 390 miles of driving range combined electricity and gasoline. Not a great deal more than the X3 either. It is going to have more power than either the BMW or the Mercedes, however, 362 horsepower, and they're saying a 0-60 to 60 time of 5 seconds even, thanks to a 7-speed dual-clutch transmission. This is the only entry in this segment that uses a DCT in their plug-in hybrid. Amazingly, Audi is claiming that the cargo capacity is identical to the non-hybrid model at 25.1 cubic feet. However, that still puts it below the X3's cargo capacity of 27. Hopefully I'll be able to drive the Q5 plug-in hybrid here soon. I was supposed to have driven it already. Unfortunately, this pandemic has thrown a wrench into the works and we don't know exactly when that will happen. That brings us along to the Volvo XC60 T8, the European option that marches to a different drummer. Volvo has had a real success with their plug-in hybrid models. Now, when we take a look at sales, Volvo does not sell as many plug-in hybrids as BMW does, but as a percentage of their sales, or as a slice of the pie, Volvo is selling considerably more plug-in hybrids versus gasoline models than we see the rest of the European competition. And I think that's due to the way that Volvo has positioned their hybrid system and the way that they've designed their hybrid system as well. It's trying to be a no-compromises hybrid where we have the same kind of cargo capacity that we find in the non-hybrid model. Now, we do lose a little 
little bit of cargo practicality on the inside. We don't have a center console that's as big or as deep because that's where the battery is located. And we do lose a smidge of center rear passenger legroom because of that position of the battery. But the cargo area is exactly the same. Volvo has also decided to make their plug-in hybrid the range topping model. So rather than the German options where it's one step above the base, Volvo positions theirs at the complete top end of the line, both in terms of luxury features, pricing, and performance. Volvo system takes the regular XC60 from 316 horsepower up to 400, so the most powerful hybrid system in this group, 4.9 to 4.8 seconds, 0 to 60, depending on which version that you get, and we get the same 30.8 cubic foot trunk that we find in the non-hybrid XC60. Efficiency is a little bit lower than some of these other options, however, 58 MPGE when operating in EV mode, 26 miles per gallon when operating as a hybrid, however. That's the second most efficient just behind the Audi. And they didn't change the gas tank. Because of the design of this system, we still get 500 miles of total combined driving range. So if you're looking for a vehicle that doesn't need to be filled up very often, this may be a good option. We get 17 miles of EV range, so a little bit less than I'm expecting in the new Mercedes-Benz GLC plug-in hybrid. That might be around 20 or so, but 17 is still not half bad. Even though the XC60 is the fastest option here, it's priced pretty similarly to the Mercedes and the Audi, which I was quite surprised by. Now that means that the BMW is obviously going to be the value option here. And I have to admit, if my cash were on the line, that's probably where I would go. Even though we don't have the thrust that we find in the XC60, it's gonna be less expensive. BMW's hybrid system is also very, very smooth. I was really impressed with the way that felt out on the road. Now. Keep in mind, if you get carried away with options on your BMW X3 plug-in hybrid, you can definitely get it up to the price of the XC60 T8. And if you're doing that, then I might just get the XC60 instead. However, if you're looking at the midline or lower end configurations of the X3 plug-in hybrid, that's probably where I would go. Personally, I prefer the styling of the XC60 more. I like the interior styling and the exterior styling but there's a great value proposition with the X3, and I think that everything in that vehicle is just really, really well done and very well integrated. So if my cash were on the line right now, I would probably get the X3. Runner up here would be the XC60 T8. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. What would you choose if you were shopping in this segment right now? In the meantime, be sure and hit all those buttons down there at the bottom of your screen, the join button, the subscribe button, the notification button, all those sorts of things. Check out the merch that you may find uh, down there. You can also head over to facebook.com slash alexandatos and see what we're driving this week. I'll see all of you later.